beautiful Point Ellis House in Victoria to introduce our books. But first, uh, my name is Adina Malcolm. And I'm Vanessa Wynn. And I'd like to tell you how we met. Um, I've been doing Tai Chi for about 10 years. And last year, Vanessa joined our group. And at, in December, when we were having a luncheon, I was sitting next to her and we started talking. And we discovered that we were both writers. We both write historical fiction. And we had both just finished writing books that were set in 19th century Victoria. In fact, they were set right here at Point Ellis House. So we decided to have a joint book launch at Point Ellis House. And then the COVID-19 struck. And so we are now having a reading and a virtual book launch here. So we thought it was quite a coincidence that not only were we writers, but that we both wrote, had written a book about Point Ellis, and also that the, um, the timing of, uh, it takes many years to write a book, and that we had both happened to have finished it about the same time, and we were both planning on um, launching um, late this spring or summer, and of course, as Adina mentioned, it didn't go quite according to plan because of the pandemic. But here we still are at Point Ellis, and I'm sure it will last um, another century. <laughs> that was totally ad lib. <laughs> The inspiration for my novel, House of Crows, came to me while I was visiting here at Point Ellis House some years ago. I was fascinated by the story of Kathleen O'Reilly, the young daughter of the O'Reilly family who lived here during the last part of the 19th century. In 1891, she was engaged to marry a naval officer, Captain Stanhope. He was the son of an earl. But she soon called off the engagement because she couldn't bear to leave her family and her hometown of Victoria. For some reason, I imagined how her decision would have seemed to an ambitious and jealous young maid who was working for her. Having also visited the Craigflower Manor, I imagined this maid having worked at Craigflower Farm. So this was the germ of my idea, but I had to do some research. And the first thing I realized was that it wouldn't work because while Kathleen O'Reilly was engaged in 1891, the Craigflower Farm had only existed in the 1850s. So the O'Reilly's maid couldn't have lived there. Her mother and her grandmother could have though. So I began to see the novel as a multi-generational tale, a story of three generations of women, the maid, Maggie, her mother, Lucy, and her grandmother, Edie, my editor, Kyle Hawk, has called them the maid, the mother, and the crone. The title House of Crows doesn't refer to Point Ellis House, but rather to the house where the three women lived. And the crows referred to their black clothes, the two widows' weeds, and Maggie's maid costume. It took some time for me to get the structure of the novel just right. Each chapter is in three parts, braiding together the stories of each of the women at different times in their lives. Maggie's seven years of servitude here at Point Ellis House provide the present time of the novel. Maggie is an entirely fictitious character. My research shows that no maid ever remained in service to the O'Reillys for as long as seven years. Most maids found a husband for themselves rather, than, rather sooner than Maggie did. So Maggie's story is somewhat of a romance, while her mother's and grandmother's tales are more tragic in nature. She is their hope for a better future. So the reading I'm going to do is from chapter four, and it's um, Maggie's part of the chapter. It begins in Kathleen O'Reilly's bedroom and moves to the stable, and this takes place in 1892. 
79, said Maggie, as she drew the brush through Miss O'Reilly's long chestnut brown hair. For almost a year now, Maggie had been following this routine almost every morning, 100 brush strokes. But this morning, Miss O'Reilly was impatient. That's enough for now. She took the brush from Maggie and laid it on the dressing table. I was thinking, would you like some tickets for the bazaar on Sunday? You could take your mother. Miss O'Reilly was involved in a project to raise money for the new Jubilee Hospital, Royal Jubilee Hospital. As well as being beautiful and talented, she was generous. If Maggie had even some of Miss O'Reilly's accomplishments and opportunities, she'd be married by now. Probably to the handsome Captain Stanhope and living in a castle in England. But Miss O'Reilly was here in Victoria working at a bazaar to collect money for a hospital. There was no point being jealous of all her accomplishments if she didn't know how to use them. Thank you, Miss. That's so kind, Maggie said. Would you like me to pin your hair up? She asked, though she knew the answer beforehand, Maggie only ever succeeded in making a mess of it. She was honestly surprised that the O'Reillys still kept her on as a maid. If there wasn't such a shortage of maids in Victoria, they probably wouldn't have. No, thank you. I can manage. Will you let the groom know that I'll be taking the pony carriage this morning, please? Yes, miss, she said, eager for the opportunity to go out and talk to the handsome young groom. Besides Lee, the only men she ever saw in her position were tradesmen. There was Simon, who delivered coal. His natural skin color was as black as his product. He frightened her, though when she plucked up enough courage to take a look at him, he quite took her breath away. The size of him and his muscles bulging even through his shirt. She felt herself blushing. What nonsense. Terence the groom was a more reasonable possibility. He was young, good looking, and the same social class as she was, though that was not necessarily an asset. He was capable and handled horses well. Enough ambition or a wife to push him, he could go into business, open his own stable or transfer service, then make something of himself. Granny often told her that the important men of the town had once been no better than she was, just indentured farm laborers from the old country. But they'd used the land they acquired wisely, working hard and made something of themselves. If Maggie couldn't marry a wealthy man, finding one who'd make something of himself was the next best thing. Good morning, she said, walking into the stable. She stopped short. A horse was standing there out of its stall. Its ears pricked up and its wild eyes glared at her. She stepped back. Maggie was afraid of horses, so big and unpredictable. Their quick movements made her heart beat faster, made her remember something. A horse running in the snow, its mane flowing, and terror. That was all. She could never see more than that in her vision. Terence emerged from behind the horse with a brush in his hand. Maggie hadn't noticed him there. She was relieved, but still didn't have the courage to step toward him. Good morning to you, he replied. And how are you this fine morning? I'm fine, she said, keeping one eye on the horse to make sure it didn't bolt in her direction. And you? He shrugged. Miss O'Reilly wants the pony carriage this morning. She's taking it to the bazaar at the assembly hall. What time does she want it ready? I think as soon as possible. The bazaar only starts this afternoon, but she's going this morning to help set it up. Well, he said, turning his back to her, I'll get the carriage ready then. The horse put its head down, ignoring her also, and she sighed with relief. But this conversation wasn't going well. It was all business. What could she talk about with this young man? He knew horses. Do you have your own horse, Terence? she asked. I wish he did, he replied. But no, I haven't the money for that. Do you walk to work then? No, I usually take the streetcar. What time do you finish work? Perhaps we could ride the streetcar together. I doubt that, he said. Unless you live out on the arm, that's where I'm staying. No, she said, I live in town. My mama and granny used to live on the arm when they first came here, though. Well, I've been living there since last spring. Really? I thought people only camped out there. 
Sometimes the wealthy inhabitants camped out in the wilderness. They took their maids and Chinese cooks. Maggie was glad the O'Reillys never did. She didn't much relish the idea of roughing it. Granny thought it was just nostalgic nonsense. Well, I started camping out there for my safety when the smallpox broke out. Lots of young men do. With the street guard going directly there over the Point Ellis Bridge, it's very convenient. She thought he was needlessly alarmed about the smallpox. There'd only been a few cases. Not like the terrible outbreak back in 1862. Maggie had heard about that from Granny and Mama. And besides, this time everyone had been vaccinated by do old Dr. Helmican. Where do your parents live? she asked. Downtown, he said, still brushing the chestnut mane of the horse. It was the same color as Miss O'Reilly's hair. What does your father do? she asked. He works for Victoria Transfer Company as an ostler. Oh, he works with horses too, Maggie said. Is that how you come by your love of horses? I guess so, he said. I'll have a horse of my own one day. Ah, so he did have an ambition. It wasn't a very great one, but it was a start. Would you like to have a stable filled with horses like Mr. O'Reilly, she asked, trying to encourage him. I couldn't imagine it, he said. Or even your own transfer company, perhaps. Wouldn't you like that? He looked at her queerly, and she wondered if she'd gone a little too far. No, I just want one horse of my own so I can ride it on my days off. I'd enter the race at Beacon Hill Park on the Queen's birthday. It's been my dream ever since I was a little boy. One horse is enough for me if it's fast enough. So a tiny bit of ambition then. Certainly not enough to meet Granny's requirements. Maggie wondered if it would even be enough to meet her own. Well, Terence, she said, Miss O'Reilly has given me two tickets to the bazaar on Sunday. She swallowed her fear. I, I wonder if you'd like to come with me. Oh, I couldn't miss, he said, rousing himself from his horse riding dream. The danger of the smallpox isn't past, and I'd rather not take any risks till it is. Maggie's face must have shown her disappointment because he hastened to add, but thank you very much for the offer, miss. Perhaps some other time then, she said, gathering her skirts. <clears throat> Good day. She turned and walked back to the house. She should have known better. Granny always said that a lady didn't invite a gentleman, but then she wasn't a lady and he wasn't a gentleman. All the same, it stung to be turned down. <laughs>